Brady McGee, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Appreciate being here. Thank you. So we're talking Monday morning. Um, big news is that a female wolf from southeastern Arizona has been making her way through New Mexico um, the past month or so. Can you give us a little update on where she is and where she's been traveling? Um, I can give you an update. In fact, uh, we um, captured her yesterday and moved her to our Sivieta Pen. She was traveling up in northeast New Mexico, about um, 90 miles north of I-40, about 15 miles east of Angel Fire, um, kind of settled in in that area, and has been up there for um, most of the month of January. And so, um, so as of yesterday, um, we uh, anytime a wolf moves north of I-40, our protocol is to monitor it for at least 14 days. Let it see if it will move back south of I-40 on its own. Um, our main recovery program is trying to recover wolves south of I-40. And so um, any wolves that move north of I-40 are fully protected under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, south of I-40, we have a 10J population with reduced regulation so that we can more effectively manage wolves, especially a large predator that uh, eats livestock. And so um, when wolves move north of I-40 and they are attacking livestock, there's nothing landowners can do about it because they're fully protected under the act. And this wolf uh, moved north into an area and settled on private land. And um, after 14 days, it was pretty obvious it wasn't gonna move back down south. And um, at the request of the landowners, we've captured it and um, it's currently in a pen at uh, our Sibieta National Wildlife Refuge. And so what will happen to her next? So she will go back out into the wild. Um, we have several different options. She originated in Arizona um, out of the Prime Canyon Pack. And so one of the things that we are looking at is um, putting her together with a mate right now and releasing her back out into the wild in April. Um, we could put her back out into the wild in Arizona, or we could translocate her to Mexico and release her into the wild down there. Part of this recovery program is establishing a second population in Mexico, about 150 miles south of the border um, of the Arizona-New Mexico border. And right now the population down there is about 30 to 40 individuals. So we're really trying to boost the population down there. Our population here in the U.S. is um, around 200 individuals, and so uh, we're doing fairly good here in the U.S., but we're still trying to bolster the population down there. And so right now she is in captivity. Um, her genetics are actually not very good. Um, she's, they're pretty redundant. She's pretty inbred. Um, so we are looking at um, uh, selecting a mate for her that would give us uh, the best genetics and the best contribution in the wild. I'm worried that if we were to just take her and translocate her directly to the wild, that she would, um, you know, we can't control who she mates with and she might select somebody that uh, perpetuates bad genetics. And so we are trying to bolster that genetics by selecting a mate for her. And then we will release her back out in the wild in April uh, before she dens and has pups. So just to back up a little bit, when she left Arizona in December, um, what was she what was she doing? What was she looking for? So she is a one year old female um, that is dispersing from her natal pack, which is pretty common for one year olds. Um, sometimes the females will stick around till they're two years old and kind of help out with the pack um, and help raise the offspring the next year. But um, a lot of times, um, uh, most wolves disperse about one year old. They go look for new territories, look for new mates. And so she uh, traveled over 350 miles uh, crossing New Mexico, moving north up. Uh, she actually crossed um, I-25 uh, near Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge, went over towards crossing the north part of White Sands Missile Range, went over toward the Manzano Mountains uh, and crossed I-40 a couple of times, just uh, kind of east of the Edge, Edgewood area, um, the East Mountains. And so she was looking for new territories, looking for new mates. And where she landed and established up in Northern New Mexico, 
just east of Angel Fire. Um, there's no other wolves up in that area. Uh, it is uh, right now is the prime mating season. And so there was a lot of concerns about her just getting in trouble, um, connecting or get, getting together with uh, feral do uh, dogs or ranch dogs um, or anything like that. So uh, she up in that area, she is not contributing to recovery and is likely to get in trouble. So that's part of the decision of uh, capturing her and moving her back down south into the recovery area. So we've talked about this sort of I-40 boundary, um, and as I understand it, um, south of the boundary, um, livestock owners can harass or haze um, wolves away from their livestock. North of I-40, the full protections of the Endangered Species Act prevent that from happening. So how did that I-40 boundary, like how was that decided upon? So under the Endangered Species Act, when we designate a 10J, um, we have to draw lines on the map. Um, the Endangered Species Act says you gotta draw the line somewhere. And uh, most of the time, whenever we do uh, 10J to reintroduce an animal uh, and draw those lines on the map, we draw it around uh, their historic range. And the, the historic range of the Mexican wolf is south of I-40 all the way down through south central Mexico. So historically, 90% of the Mexican wolf subspecies population occurred in Mexico. And so um, because of that reason, the boundary was drawn at I-40. How does the Fish and Wildlife Service try to um, focus on the recovery of the species with, with so much controversy on all sides? It is a very controversial program. I don't know of too many other programs throughout the country um, that are more controversial. I mean, we've got you got northern grace um, and grizzly bears, um, but Mexican wolves are right up there. The most controversial uh, species try to recover to try to recover, and it makes it very difficult because we're really trying to ba uh, find the balance of um, growing a population. Uh, and also at the same time uh, offsetting the impacts that it has on the livestock industry and so um, one of our primary goals of this program is to try to manage and reduce livestock depredations when they do occur through the southwest so we've got a number of tools a number of partners uh, we partner with Arizona Game and Fish, New Mexico Game and Fish, USDA Wildlife Services, Forest Service, BLM Park Service. We've got a lot of um, partners in this program and each one of them, we're all working together. We're contributing money to range riders, um, to all sorts of hazing and harassing techniques to prevent depredations. Um, we can't always uh, prevent it. A lot of times uh, we can though. And so we uh, spend a vast amount of time, effort, energy, staff, personnel, resources to uh, reduce livestock depredations as part of the program. It's one of our primary goals. Because without that, we won't have the social tolerance um, or the tolerance to be able to uh, recover wolves here in the Southwest. And so do you feel like over the course of the, the program and by having these measures in place, have ranchers in southwestern New Mexico become more tolerant of wolves? Um, some have and some haven't. And I don't think um, some ever will, um, but I think there are a number of ranchers out there that we're working with that are altering their operations, that are using our preventative um, uh, measures that are um, trying to really work on ways of offsetting the impacts. And we have a lot of cases where we've got wolves dinning uh, with livestock, around livestock, and a lot of packs that um, are not depredating on livestock. And so, um, I, you know, a lot of the measures are working. It's never going to be foolproof. There will always, you know, wolves will, will eat cows. Um, you know, their, their primary prey source is elk. And so um, whenever uh, you know, they are hungry or if it's easier to kill a cow and they're in that area, they're gonna do so. Um, but you know, if we can haze them, harass them, teach them not to, um, and to stay away from cows, then 
that's one of our primary goals. Brady, thank you so much. I appreciate you um, talking me through this controversial <laughs> topic. Sure. Thank you.